Okay. All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our virtual presentation on Carlsbad Caverns National Park. For those who may not know me, my name is Katia Gonzalez. I'm the Development Director for the Frontera Land Alliance, and I'm delighted to be facilitating today's session. Okay. Frontera's mission is to protect forever open natural spaces, working farms, ranches, watersheds, and wildlife in the Northern Chihuahuan Desert. Frontera is also committed to environmental conservation and education, and we are honored to have the opportunity to delve into the wonders of Carlsbad Caverns National Park with all of you. Okay, let's see. Throughout the next hour, we'll be joined by a special guest who will be guiding us through an introduction to Carlsbad Caverns. If any questions come up during the presentation, feel free to add them to the chat and we can address them at the end of the session or feel free to unmute and ask them yourself. And without further ado, allow me to introduce our knowledgeable ranger from Carlsbad Caverns, Zachary Nash, who brings a wealth of expertise and passion for conservation to today's presentation. And with that, the floor, the virtual floor is all yours, Zachary. Okay, hello. Thank you so much for that, Katia. Um, so I have here for you guys today a PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to aim to do this for about 30 to 45 minutes or so, and then leave some time uh, for any questions you may have at the end of this. Um, you may be noting a bit of lag with my internet right now, especially a, a lag between the audio and the visual. Um, I'm sorry about that. Can't really do anything about it. Uh, the park's internet is not always super great for live streaming stuff, but uh, since we're doing the PowerPoint anyway, hopefully it won't make a huge difference. Uh, I'm assuming everybody here can see the PowerPoint okay. Um, it, I am sharing it, of course. Yes. All right. Um, very good. Yeah, so the, the title of the program is A History of Carlsbad Caverns and the Park Today, right? So I'm going to, I've got three little sections. The first is sort of a short history of some things just about national parks on the, and the National Park Service itself. The second part is kind of the body of the program. It's sort of a history of Carlsbad Caverns National Park, both a natural history, which is to say kind of how it formed and a bit of a human history to it as well. Um, some of the human development, some of the decisions that were made here. And lastly, we're gonna talk about some things uh, that draw people to the park today. Some things on offer, some things we still do, those sorts of things, right? So uh, let's go ahead and begin. Um, so this is a very nice quote from George Catlin in 1832, right? Something about the national parks that I think it's important to understand is that the national parks as an idea are something that are pretty uniquely American in nature, right? Um, no other country had really had this idea in the 19th century, the 1800s, of just setting aside wilderness or land or historical sites or what have you just for everybody to go to, right? During this time period, people just you know, if you owned land, then it was your land and you could keep everybody out, right? But this idea that the entire nation should own a beautiful tract of wilderness and that this tract of wilderness should be preserved is an American idea, right? So the 19th century, the 1800s is when this idea starts to kind of develop, right? Hot Springs, Arkansas is the home of some pretty nice historic bathhouses. It still is today. And so all the way back in 1832, we can kind of plant the seed for the national park idea. Um, it was reserved. They created a hot springs reservation in the state of Arkansas, quote, for the future disposal of the United States, right? The idea, however, for that was recreation and not preservation. In 1864, Congress donated Yosemite Valley, which is today one of the most well-known national parks in the country, to California to preserve as a state park. It's now a national park, but at that time it was one of the first state parks, which was also a new idea, right? And of course, uh, our beloved Yellowstone that everybody 
knows of as well, right? That was the first national park in the country, right? And that was established in 1872 in what is now Wyoming because Wyoming did not have a state government because Wyoming was not a state, right? So that's sort of how this all begins in the 19th century, right? Now, skipping over a few decades, we can get to the laws, right? The actual laws here, the, these two laws, the Antiquities Act and the Organic Act, are the ones that really sort of make all of that permanent, right? The Antiquities Act meant that the President of the United States could just unilaterally, and by that I mean via an executive order himself without Congress, he could set aside lands, historical sites, monuments. He could declare these things to be national monuments, right? Which wasn't precisely the same thing as a national park, but was very close, right? A lot of these sites that eventually become national parks, they start as national monuments, right? The, because the president wants to sort of quickly protect them and then get Congress to approve it later. That's kind of how that worked in Washington, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in 1916, the Organic Act actually makes the National Park Service a thing, right? The National Park Service itself is created as a new agency of the federal government to actually run these sites, to preserve and protect them, that sort of thing, right? Um, that's where the rangers come in. That's where the money comes in. And it's after the National Park Service is created that just the citizens of the United States really start saying, you know, this, this is pretty cool. You know, we should get out there and millions of these people do this, right? We should get out to these parks and we should see what's going on here, right? So that's the National Park Service itself, right? Now let's talk about Carlsbad, right? So Carlsbad Caverns, right? The cave has been here for many millions of years, right? But it was not actually um, designated a part of this system. And let, let me, can, can you all see my mouse? Can we see my mouse? Um, yes. If you look mm -hmm. at this, if you can't see it, uh, if you look at this map up here, um, this is where it is, by the way. Um, we're in southeast New Mexico, right? Right across the border from Guadalupe Mountains National Park in Texas, right? So this does not actually join the system until 1923. At that time, it was designated Carlsbad Cave National Monument by President Calvin Coolidge. And uh, it became a national park only seven years later, um, assuming its current name, Carlsbad Caverns National Park in the year 1930, right? But that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves. Um, so now we're going to go back a lot further than that in time, okay? So Carlsbad Caverns itself, to understand where this cave comes from, we have to go long before the cave, right? We have to go back a whopping 250 million years. This is before the dinosaurs, for you guys understanding. Uh, the dinosaurs weren't even alive in 250 million years ago. Um, but if you can imagine what the world would have looked like at that time, the continents were not in the same places. The oceans did not look the same, right? Um, at that time, all the continents were joined together. There was no North America, no South America, no Europe, no Asia. It was just all one supercontinent called Pangaea, right? And at that time, what is now the state of New Mexico and Texas and the entire southwestern United States, that was covered by an inland sea, okay? A saltwater inland sea that looked something like this, okay? Uh, so you can see the, the outlines of what are now Texas and New Mexico's borders. Where we are now in Carlsbad Caverns, this was a tropical reef 250 million years ago. It was not even your typical kind of tropical reef because there really were not any fish there. And there weren't really any corals either. I'm going back to my last slide. If you look at this picture here in the bottom right of the slide, um, it would have looked something more like that. 
Um, this reef had a lot of sponges in, as kind of its main constituents, its, its main building blocks instead of corals. And uh, some of the major life forms that lived at that time were these trilobites is what they're called and ammonites. Um, these creatures all lived uh, during what is called the Permian period. And the Permian period came to an end <laughs> roughly 250 million years ago and when it ended basically all of those creatures died um some 90 to 95 percent in fact of all species of life on earth died at the end of the permian period and this was w the single worst mass extinction in the history of life on this planet right um it is believed by scientists to have been caused by a number of things, but mainly this volcanic activity that was so intense, it released so much carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere that it changed the climate of this planet. Um, the climate is said to have gone up some 10 degrees Celsius, which uh, is enough to deoxygenate and acidify the oceans and kill almost all marine life. And um, terrestrial life did not fare much better. So life itself underwent a tremendous change, but the sea, the sea itself also underwent a tremendous change. It got cut off eventually over millions of years. It got cut off from the rest of the ocean and it got isolated. And what happens to a giant body of water that can't get more water? It very slowly dries up. So the sea eventually evaporated over thousands, if not millions of years. Um, no more water, right? And uh, it ended up looking something more like this, eventually. This is what it looks like today, but we'll have to skip that. We'll have to return to that, right? Pretty big difference. So now we're going to skip many millions of years, right, and talk about how this actual cave formed. So where I was a bit ago, that was 250 million years ago. Now we're going to jump to about 50 to 60 million years ago, right? So at this time, our continents have moved around. At this time, our world looks a lot more like it does today. There's no, I, I believe the dinosaurs are gone by then. And we are having some plate tectonics, right? What happens is that um, what is now the Guadalupe Mountains, which is where this park is, the plates next to each other that create the mountains start to butt up against each other, the plates of the Earth's surface. And when they butt up, they push and push, and they create what geologists call uplift. That means just that the mountains come up out of what was previously flat ground. And when that uplift occurs, we can first start to see what is going to eventually lead to the cave formation, right? As the mountains come up and the ground changes shape, it creates fissures gradually, right? And what happens with that is that the water table and the fossil fuel pockets that were underneath the water table in what is today the Permian Basin, which is the most the single richest oil field in the United States, what happens is that these things are allowed to mix together along with oxygen and carbon dioxide that comes through these cracks from the surface, right? And when that stuff happens, we start having these unique chemical reactions that start to create the cave chambers, right? What happens is that the oxygenated water from the surface and from the water table is able to mix with uh, this pre-existing gas down here that comes from the petroleum underneath the earth. When these things mix, they create sulfuric acid, okay? And sulfuric acid is a very acidic acid. It is something that is able to very easily, and by easily, I mean in a relative sense, it still, it still takes a very long time. But uh, in a relative sense, it is very easy, easily able to dissolve limestone, okay? And limestone is what this cave is made out of, right? The, that's the principal building block, 
that's the main rock that this is all made out of. So what happens is that over millions of years, millions of years, as these mountains are pushed up and all of this changes shape, that sulfuric acid is not only created, but it spreads, right? It spreads into the shape to, to sort of carve out the cave chambers, essentially from the bottom up. And the reason I tell you the bottom up and the reason I tell you about this process is because this is really unique in the world of caves. Um, when it comes to cave formation, for the great majority of caves on Earth, most caves do not form this way. Um, to put it simply, most caves involve water coming sort of from the surface and sort of carving it from the top down, right? Um, they, they form a, a substance called carbonic acid to do that. And like I just told you, our cave here, it's, it's more, of, more of a bottom up formation. What that means, and what I'll expand upon later in the presentation, is the Carlsbad Caverns has some really big cave chambers. Most caves, um, as e even other caves in this country that you go to, say uh, Karchner Caverns in Arizona, Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, Wind Cave in North Dakota, if you go to any of these pretty famous caves, you will see that they are th the chambers are not very big. The chambers themselves are sort of more cramped, a little more claustrophobic, but they're much longer than our cave. Our cave is not as long, but it's got these really big chambers. And uh, when people come here, they tell us that. They say to us, I've never seen a cave like this, and I've been to caves all over this country. That's why, right? Pretty unique formation. So this cave roughly had formed by about four to six million years ago, okay? So, after the cave had formed, we had the cave chambers by that point, right? But we did not have the cave decorations. Um, in order to, quote-unquote, decorate the cave, to form the cave formations, uh, like these ones that we're familiar with, uh, stalactites hanging from the ceilings, stalagmites that push up from the ground, and columns where they meet together, in order to form those and all the other cave formations that exist within this cave, we still had to have many thousands more years for that to occur. The reason for that, and many, many of you probably know this, uh, or at least somewhat familiar, is that in order to form cave formations, water has to seep from the surface through the entire ground, which in the case of our cave can mean like 750, 800 feet from the surface, right? The water has to seep through that surface and it has to pick up these minerals um, along the way, right? Um, dissolved carbon dioxide helps form this mineral called calcium carbonate, also, no, also known as calcite. And the water seeps down through the surface and it goes through the limestone because limestone is a very porous type of stone, right? When that water gets through the limestone and it arrives in the cave chamber, the water, depending on how, depending on like how fast it drops, depending on how much water there is, depending on uh, a lot of variables, the water will deposit that calcite somewhere. And depending on how long it does that, we'll eventually have a cave formation, right? So when you look, you guys told me you can see my mouse. When you look at um, something like this, when you look at a stalagmite of this size, a very, very large stalagmite, I would estimate this is maybe 30 or 40 feet tall for reference. You're talking about something that takes probably hundreds of thousands of years to get to that size, right? Because even, even if you have a pretty dang constant stream of water and, and a lot of calcite, it takes that water so long to move that much mineral and to cement it like that, that, yeah, um, it can take hundreds of thousands of years. Now, let's talk about human history. Um, the first people that inhabited the Guadalupe Mountains did so as long as 12,000 years ago 
we, we are now actually starting to find evidence that peoples could have been, native peoples could have been in what is now New Mexico as early as 14,000 years ago. Um, so that science is actively changing because that, that was only a few months ago that they discovered that. Um, so there have been a number of Native American cultures that have inhabited this area. Um, many of them, uh, one of the most well-known ones um, from thousands of years ago, were known simply as the basket weavers. We don't know just a whole lot about the basket weavers, other than uh, they made fine baskets and that these artifacts are among the most plentiful that remain of their culture. Um, we do, of course, have other things such as uh, materials like this, like arrowheads and uh, flint hand tools and things like that. But the native group that we most associate with this park, in part because of recency bias, is the Mescalero Apache people. The Mescalero Apache are not the only people to consider this place sacred, to inhabit this place within the last several centuries or anything of that source. Um, however, they are the most numerous and they are the uh, native group with which the tribe has um, the most strong relationship. OK, these groups left behind all kinds of artifacts. Um, they left behind large mescal cooking pits. They left behind arrowheads. They even left behind what are called pictographs, where they painted upon the cave walls and even on even on the cave entrance. However, one thing we should make clear, um, Carlsbad Cavern itself, our, our principal cave within the park, we do not have evidence we do have evidence for sure that they knew about this cave so they discovered it however we do not have evidence that they ventured very far into it simply because naturally this particular cave was so treacherous to enter before the current path to enter it that it would have been extremely dangerous to do so that does not mean that they did not enter it um, but if they did you know we simply don't have that evidence right there are many hundred, there's more than 100 parks that we know, of, caves within this park that we know of today, and we do have firm evidence that they entered those caves. Um, however, we do not have evidence that they entered our principal show cave, Carlsbad Cavern. Now, moving on, this figure, Jim White, is whom we credit at the park as the first uh, Anglo-American so sort of explorer and promoter of the cave. Um, he was only 16 years old, um, and he only had a third grade education when, in 1898, he saw a flight of bats that was so thick on the horizon that he thought he was seeing a smoke cloud. He thought he was seeing a giant fire in the distance, right? When he got close to it and he saw that these were not, that this was not smoke, but these were bats, hundreds of thousands of bats leaving, he said to himself, supposedly, that must be one whale of a cave down there. So within a few days, he made himself a homemade ladder and he brought a lantern and he just went for it. He went in there and said, I'm, I'm going to go check this out. Right. And when he did so, he was absolutely blown away by what he saw. Um, he knew immediately that this was one of the most incredible caves out there. He just he just knew by instinct that there were not going to be many caves on Earth like this. So he went to the nearby town of Carlsbad, then no, at that time known as Eddy, and he told the residents of Eddy about this cave, and he tried to get anybody who would come with him to come out and see this, right? Now, a few years later, after the cave became a little bit more no well-known, this figure on the right here, this man named Abijah Long, he saw a bit of an opportunity to make some money off this cave. Um, and to do so, he wanted to mine guano. And for you, for all of you that may not know what guano is, it is bat poop. There is a story, um, I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a story that's passed around by the rangers here at the park that Jim White, when he first descended into that cave, saw piles of guano that were 90 to 100 feet tall. Um, if you can imagine what that smelled like, uh, yeah, you probably got a pretty good idea what that what that might have smelled like, right? Uh, but regardless, Abijah Long here he filed a um, he filed a claim on the cave because it was as yet not 
it wasn't anything. It was just a cave, right? Nobody claimed the land. Nobody owned the land. And so Mr. Long claimed it as a guano mine. Um, if you're wondering what you would possibly want to use guano for, back then, guano was an extremely fertile fertilizer. So Mr. Long here, he paid people to set up the infrastructure and to actually work the guano mine, right? To just shovel this stuff into giant bags, put it on a mine cart, and then heft it out in a giant bucket, right? You can see uh, where they hefted it out with this, uh, with this structure here in the bottom right picture on the slide. And then they would ship it all the way to California to sell to a fertilizer company. Um, this guano mining... For one, it took place in Carlsbad Cavern itself for 20 years, all the way up until it was a national monument. And uh, some 100,000 tons of bat guano were mined from the cave. That, 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 is, a, that is a lot of bat guano for, rec for reference, right? However, uh, even after the park was declared a national park, and even after they stopped guano mining in our cave, they started mining other caves within the park. Um, that process went all the way till 1957 before they finally stopped. And uh, unfortunately, some other caves within the park were damaged by this process. Uh, they were supposed to observe rules when they did this, and uh, they did not do that. Very good. So moving on, um, like I said, in 1923, that is when Carlsbad Cave National Monument was established, and it did not take super long for Carlsbad Caverns National Park to be declared in 1930, right? That's really a pretty short time span within the history of the National Park Service. Um, the place, after becoming a national monument, was sort of an immediate hit. Um, Mr. Jim White, uh, this figure that I told you about, right, the cowboy who, just, who uh, explored the place and promoted it, he was actually the first park ranger here, and he would lead people on tours through the cavern based solely on his own knowledge off the maps that he made himself by hand. He would do these tours with kerosene lanterns. He would do it without a path, right, because there was no path for the earliest tours, and he would get people down into the cave in the guano mining bucket. Now, isn't that fun? if not a little dangerous. Well, something else I wanted to share with you as part of this process, this man, Robert Hawley, he came from what was then called the General Land Office. I, I think that's the Department of the Interior now. I might be mistaken about that. But he was asked to investigate on behalf of the federal government to see if this thing should be called a national monument or not. And he has this famous quote here that is uh, a little verbose, but I think it's quite beautiful, uh, that describes precisely what he thought about this place. In other words, after you read this quote, you get the idea that Mr. Hawley, when he came here to see this, was pretty much immediately convinced, like, yeah, we got, we got to preserve this. This is a big deal. Like, the, we got to get the people in Washington on board with this. Okay? So, moving on. Um, as more and more people in the 1930s and 40s started going to their national parks all across the country, many thousands of people started showing up to Carlsbad Caverns. And uh, the cave needed uh, some more accessible inf infrastructure than a guano mining bucket, right? And so they started building stuff to just be able to accommodate visitors as a show cave rather than a guano mine. At first, they built, uh, th this is one of, uh, if you see my mouse here, the top left picture, this uh, wooden staircase here was one of the first ways that people got down before the current paved concrete trail was put in. That structure actually still exists in the cave. It is not in good shape. Uh, it is quite moldy and rotten, and uh, we keep it solely just for people to look at, right? Um, but we also put in an elevator. In 1932, um, it was kind of a technological marvel to make a 750-foot elevator shaft in 1932, and they blasted the entire thing just out of the side of the mountain with dynamite. Uh, it's not something that we really want to do today, but the elevators have remained pretty vital uh, just to being able to accommodate people getting in and out of the cave. And they put in um, many seating areas 
for rangers to be able to bring groups of hundreds of people in at once and then give presentations. That's what you can see in the central picture here. This ranger is giving a presentation to a very large group of people uh, in what is called the big room today, right? Um, let's see here. So... In 1938, specifically, um, one of the famous organizations of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, New Deal administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, they established a camp at what is now called Rattlesnake Springs and is part of our park. And they did further improvements to make the place just more accessible for the public, right? Um, they installed electric wiring to light up the cave. They put a surface in the underground lunchroom, and they even built park housing. After World War II, more people than ever, millions and millions, were going to their national parks across the country. And Carlsbad was one of those most hot destinations that people wanted to go to. So in 1956, the park, just the entire National Park Service, started a 10-year program called Mission 66. What they wanted to do is by 1966 have a much better infrastructure across the entire country to accommodate people. Um, for, for the most part, that included roads, parking lots, visitor center for the, you know, car savvy American, right? And our own visitor center, in which I am coming to you right now, dates back to this time period. Uh, you wouldn't know that looking at it because it's been refurbished and well maintained, but uh, it is that old. Um, now something else, as the park's history went on, more and more caves get discovered all the time here. Um, only one cave, Carlsbad Cavern itself, is actually open to the public today, right now. We're hoping to open another for uh, public tours here this year. But this particular cave was only discovered in 1986, and it is called Lechugia Cave. Lechugia Cave is a pretty big deal because it is considered to be one of the single most pristine cave environments ever found on Earth. Um, to, to only find a new cave in 1986 like this, of this size and its depth, is extremely rare, one might say. Uh, Lechugia is among the top 10 longest and deepest caves currently on, known on Earth. Um, it is still not completely explored because it is hundreds of miles long. Um, in order to get down there, you would have to spend weeks to get to the currently lowest known part of the cave. You would have to take weeks worth of food, water, batteries, what have you, just to get down there. And you would have to undergo some extremely treacherous um, journey, uh, squeezes, rope work, uh, all kinds of fun stuff like that, right? However... Um, they found un under there such a diversity, a biodiversity of microbes and such unique cave formations that the National Park Service and Carlsbad Caverns National Park jointly decided that they cannot open this to the public. Um, this, this cave was determined to be so important and so treacherous that they are preserving it. Um, even even we park rangers that work here at Carlsbad Caverns National Park, we don't know where this cave is um, because they do not want people going in there unless you are a scientist who is also a very experienced caver, okay? Probably all for the best, I would say. And uh, in 1995, uh, we were also de designated by the United Nations as a World Heritage Site. Uh, that is kind of a big deal. Um, that means that we are culturally and aesthetically and naturally significant to the entire world. Um, we have a huge number of international visitors that come to us every day during our busy seasons. I've uh, I've seen people today that speak like, I, I, I've probably seen people that speak five other languages than English just today. Um, and this park even hires bilingual rangers, right? We have one that speaks French here. I'm one of the ones that speaks Spanish. We have several that speak Spanish, um, and we even have one that speaks some Asian languages as well. So that's the human and natural history of the park. Now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what we do today, and then I'll open up for questions, okay? So people come to Carlsbad Caverns National Park today due to the geology, right? People want to see the cave formations. We have an enormous number of cave formations. 
the big room pictured here, right, is the single largest cave chamber in the United States, right? And it is chock full of these formations absolutely everywhere. So whether you are a professional geologist of whom we get quite a few, you know, whether you're a caver or whether you're an average person who doesn't know anything about caves, the idea is you can come here and you can learn about rock, right? We have people interested in biology. Um, the single most famous denizen of our cave is the bat, right? We have here in this park some 14 to 17 species of bats total, but the lion's share of bats are these bats pictured here. These are known as Brazilian free-tailed bats, right? And uh, our colony that lives here six months out of the year in the park, they number, we estimate some 500,000 of them. Uh, so they still, during the summer months especially, they will still leave the cave entrance every night. Um, and it takes them like 30 minutes for all of them to get out. Um, just like Jim White described, it looks like a giant plume of smoke. Um, it makes for some dazzling pictures and such. And uh, people show up by the hundreds to our bat amphitheater seated right outside the cave entrance just to watch this happen every night. While they do so, a ranger will give them a program about uh, just about bats. The cave cricket is actually the second most numerous, perhaps, um, animal that lives in the cave. Uh, you wouldn't expect that because you don't really see them when you're in there. But uh, there are three species of cave cricket, and they're kind of unusual um, because they don't chirp, because they eat each other, of all things, and uh, also because they are blind. Um, they will not see you. And so their strategy is to not come out until the cave starts closing down so that people don't step on them and kill them, right? People come to Carlsbad Caverns National Park for the wilderness. Um, we do offer camping um, by permit only during, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. By permit only during certain parts of the year. Um, over 75% of this park is designated as federally designated wilderness. And it is also a significant part of what is known as the Chihuahuan Desert, um, which stretches across parts of western Texas, south New Mexico, and uh, northern Mexico. Uh, so we have a, a pretty strong biology here of desert plants and desert animals that live within the park's boundaries. Um, obviously, I've told you already uh, some about our human history. Um, we have a collection here of artifacts from native groups that have uh, that we possess in in uh, consultation with native tribal councils. We have uh, photos and stories from all the way back in Jim White's days, and we have placards and uh, signs all throughout and outside of the cavern that talk about the human history of this place. People come here for adventure right? Um, the cave offers, generally, um, most visitors come here for what is known as the self-guided tour. Um, that is the general ticket that is sold, right? And so you're able to go down the cavern um, at your own pace through the natural entrance, um, or you can skip that pretty steep and treacherous hike, and you can just take the elevator down to the big room, of which I already mentioned. Either way, um, people just on that general entry tour are able to get hours worth of fun checking out this cave. We also have special guided tours uh, into specific parts of the cave that are more delicate, uh, harder to access. And uh, those guided tours, on those guided tours, rangers have pre-prepared programs about the cave to deliver to visitors and they answer questions, right? Um, those, those tours are a little bit less curated and a little more wild, right? Um, it's a little closer to typical caving, at least for one of those tours, right? And protection, right, is a reason that some people come here as well. Some people come here because they want to know what they can learn about caves in order to better protect them. Uh, we actually have visitors, we have volunteers that come here by the dozens every month just to help pick lint, out of the trail and off of the off trail area. Um, believe it or not, when you come into a cave like this, you are constantly shedding lint from your clothes. It gets everywhere. And uh, these volunteers are here to help protect it. Um, we have 
biologists. We have resource um, people here that are hired as part of our resource office that specifically monitor the air level of the cave versus the carbon dioxide, that monitor the humidity levels, that monitor the weather. Uh, they, they check these things in order to best keep this place as protected as possible, right? And uh, those same people are able to learn more about caves themselves, about microsco microscopic cave environments. They're able to learn about bats. Um, all of this is, uh, is, is part of what Carlsbad Caverns is able to contribute to the scientific community. Resource management challenges this in, in in any national park really you will have a balance that has to be struck between how many people can come in and you know how many people can see it what can people do and how do we preserve it right how do we protect it where where do we draw the line between those two things because they're often at odds with each other right um every day people come through here and trash is left on the trails and off the trails um we rangers run sweep shifts where we have to clean up that trash right uh we have bathrooms in the cave and we had to establish a giant pump to get the sewage out of the cave and all the way back to the surface in order to not pollute things in order to not create a smell um we have lights that unfortunately allow a algae to grow in certain places of the cave um this is a thing that the resources office is actively trying to deal with so to remove the algae, right? And um, frankly, we have to have an upper capacity on the number of people that are allowed in the cave every day. Um, right now, it's like 2,300 or so. But uh, on days like today, where we're very busy, we can actually run out of tickets very early. We ran out of those tickets this morning at 9.30 a.m. So that is exactly one hour and 30 minutes after we opened. And uh, for the people that got here after that, that did not already have reservations, we had to tell them they couldn't come in the cave. Um, I had to tell people that today myself, and they were really upset. And, uh, you know, that it's, that's not fun. That, that's not a, that's not a very good thing to have to tell people, but it's, it's something that we feel we have to do in order to protect this cave and to keep it the way that it is now, to keep it from overcrowding, to keep it manageable for our rangers, and even to protect the humidity levels and the balance of oxygen versus carbon dioxide in the cave's atmosphere. So, in other words, you could really say that the future of Carlsbad Caverns National Park is up to the people that visit it in a lot of ways. If you go to your national park and you trash it and you touch the cave formations and you snap stuff off and you intentionally do things like that, it's not going to be a super great place for the people that come to visit after, is it? But uh, if you observe our rules, if you're open to learning about these sorts of things, um, you can really learn why places like this and spaces on this earth are, are so significant. Okay. So that is everything I have. Uh, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask me now? Zachary, thank you so much for that awesome interpretation. Let me see if we have any questions on our Facebook Live. Um, I don't see any. Um, By the way, you, you can see, see my uh, you can see my face again, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. I don't see any uh, questions in our Facebook Live, but I think we got one here. Um, yes. What are some threats to Carlsbad Caverns? Um. So. Like I said, just the sheer scale of visitation can be a bit of a threat um, simply because some years are going to be busier than others. And when we have max visitation, like I said, when we hit that number of like 2,300 or whatever it is every day, it can be harder for our rangers to manage, right? Because what has to happen is rangers are, we're supposed to be able to uh, rove, you know, the cave, right? There are supposed to be rangers that are roving the cave to make sure everybody is okay, to make sure people aren't damaging things, to make sure people aren't throwing trash on the ground, uh, that sort of thing. But um, when when we get such visitation, rangers get tied up in things. Uh, rangers have to help people uh, at the elevators, for example, uh, to facilitate shorter lines to get out. Uh, rangers have to, you know, work the front desk 
And uh, that provides more opportunities for people to uh, misbehave in the cave or, or even possibly have an emergency or something like that. That's not all the people's fault, of course, um, because at times, you know, at times we simply perhaps don't have as many people working that day. You know, sometimes people call out sick or people have other things they have to do. So visitation itself, uh, it can be an issue. Um, but even speaking more broadly to it, even just visitation itself, technically it is kind of damaging the cave um, because if there were no humans in this cave at all every day, it would be kind of a different place. Um, when this park was closed during COVID, I didn't actually work here at that time, but I am told uh, that apparently the oxygen levels and the versus carbon dioxide changed, the natural humidity of the cave changed, uh, the microbes that live in the little pools underwater, uh, they flourished, right? And these are things that would not exist w without us you know, just visiting the cave. So like I said, there, there's a balance that, that is struck, right? And we in the National Park Service have determined, you know, that it's worth maybe sacrificing a little bit of that humidity or a little bit of those microbes, because if people are not able to see these places, they're not going to care about them as much. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Feel free to drop them in the chat or just unmute yourself. Let me see anything. Let me double check Facebook Live again. Well, let me uh, let me expostulate here a little bit uh, on some common things that uh, people ask us here every single day. Um, one thing you should know, if you would like to come visit us here at Carlsbad Caverns National Park, um, we do very strongly recommend making a recommendation, right? You can do that online at this site I'm about to put in the chat, recreation.gov, right? You can do it online there. Um, do be aware that if it doesn't let you make the reservation on there, that means it's sold out for that day, right? Um, our reservations, for example, online have been sold out like a week in advance for like the entire past week. Um, and if, if that's the case and you have to come that week and you can't get an online reservation, you can still come. Uh, we do have walk-up tickets every single day um, for visitors without reservations, even if we are sold out of online reservations. However, if you're going to do that, um, you do need to be here early. Like I'm talking like 8 a.m. Mountain Time when we open the visitor center, right? Um, because on those days where we're sold out, there's going to be a line of people outside that visitor center before we even open, right? And uh, those walk-up tickets for people without reservations, those will sell out within the first several hours. Um, like I said, today they were they were all gone 90 minutes in an hour and a half, right? Um, so if you don't get that walk-up ticket and you don't have a reservation, you can't enter the cave that day. Um, so that is something really important to keep in mind. Awesome. Thank you, Zachary. Well, if we don't have any further questions, uh, and as our virtual exploration of Carlsbad Caverns National Park comes to a close, I want to extend a sincere thank you to Zachary for taking the time to share with us your knowledge and passion. Your insights have truly enhanced our understanding of this remarkable um, natural treasure. And I want to thank everybody for taking their time to join us this um, beautiful and windy Saturday afternoon. Um, and if you don't have any closing remarks, Zachary, uh, I just want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of their day. I guess I would say come visit. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zachary. Thank you, everyone. Certainly. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Goodbye.